good evening. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Ellis and I'm the program director here at the Natural History Institute. And um, before we get started with tonight's speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, next week at this time, we have a speaker who um, is Dr. Jeff Lovich from the USGS and Flagstaff. And he's going to be speaking on turtles. And the title of his talk is, Where Have All the Turtles Gone? And why does it matter? It should be a fascinating talk. The other announcement I'd like to make is that we've uh, recently announced our Touchstone Tour to Ecuador. So folks who are interested in that, there's information in the lobby on the, the table. And we also have announced uh, our national conference that we're going to have over in Sedona in November called Reciprocal Healing. And that comes on the heels of Tom's very successful book, love, medicine, and nature. And so we encourage you all to look at that as well. So over the course of the 200,000 years that humans have been on this planet, traveling all over the planet, there is only a handful of people who have lived in Antarctica. And of that handful, there's even a smaller handful of people who have lived on the Arctic ice cap. And of the handful of people who have lived in Antarctica and the Arctic ice cap, there is an even smaller number of people who have been responsible for the lives and safety of expeditions in those harsh landscapes. So tonight, we are very lucky to have one of those rare individuals here who has done some incredible kind of work on both poles. And uh, Steve Munsell is senior faculty at Prescott College in the Adventure Education Department. He, has, he spends his time in that arena teaching people how to take people into wilderness settings and come back successfully. And he's done that for many years. He has a wide range of interests, both academic and um, outdoor pursuit-wise. And one of the downfalls of living a life in the backcountry is that you really don't have a lot of time to tell people in the front country what you've been doing. So on top of the fact that this is a rare individual, this is a rare event because Steve really doesn't get that many opportunities to tell folks about his travels, and there's some amazing stories. So I would like for you all to help me welcome Steve Munsell. Wow, that's going to be a lot, Bob, to <laughs> live up to. I'm really lucky to have survived this far, but I want to survive this. Uh, and I really want to thank everyone for making it out here. Um, I'm going to do this technology thing. Crazy how much we're dependent on technology. Um, and yeah, this is uh, really different for me. I'm not a guy who really talks about myself. And so I realized as I started to do preparation for this that um, I was kind of out of my comfort zone. But uh, at this point in life, it's, it's kind of uh, a fun challenge to uh, have someone ask you to kind of do a re reflective review of some of your uh, life history and some of your career choices and some of your travels. So uh, I put this up just for fun. This is not so much of a resume, but just uh, a little bit of uh, chronological uh, travels to the south was where I, I started uh, as a research assistant in freezing avoidance. And everybody was like, oh, well, wow, that'll be freezing avoidance. Well, sure. Yeah, you're going to want to do that. And I was like, ooh, yeah, OK, I'll wear a coat. Um, <laughs> and then. Uh, a lot of things happen down on the ice, and, and I'll, uh, we're going to spend most of our time in the north tonight. And I realize that you can't really talk about your uh, research travels for three decades. You can't really overview the cryosphere. You can't really do the basic geography of both ends of the Earth in one single attention span. 
So I'm kind of, I, I realized I was a little beyond my scope. So I'll try to kind of keep things moving. Uh, and I used to do pretty well with photography in the film era, and then I've lost so many digital images that I've borrowed a lot of images lately. And um, so I, I wanted to credit uh, different individuals that I've traveled with uh, the, and that gave us permission to use their, their photographs. Um, references cited, you know, it's a really challenging time in the information superhighway. I've thought a lot about it preparing for this. I've really, really spent a lot of time with my head uh, wrapped around various internet sites and, and uh, there's so much um, garbage out there that it's, um, it's really sobering to, to recognize uh, just what is out there and, and, and what, where is truth anymore. And so anything that I say, you know, you're your own critical thinkers, you'll have to take it with a grain of salt, you'll have to do your own homework. I, I brought a few, uh, a few flyers, uh, just sheets of paper that have some uh, different uh, resources for cryosphere and, and climate related uh, sites if, if people are interested. Some of those I used myself and uh, others uh, I've been absolutely inspired by. Uh, I've been on the phone with a couple of folks that, uh, and I've been on email with some of the folks I've traveled with. But I think we'd, I'd like to take us to both ends of the earth. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the differences between the Arctic and the Antarctic. We're going to start in the south and we're going to travel to the north. We'll remain in the north. The cryosphere is one of those interesting words that's accepted in language and in science, but it just won't work on, uh, on uh, spell check. Uh, so the current status and observed changes, um, you know, I, these are changes, th these are observations that are, uh, some of which are in person, and, and so I kind of feel like I, I, I'm bearing witness to uh, things that I've experienced or things that I feel that are very important to share, and so I bring that to people just, just from my heart, things that I've observed. A lot of other things are, uh, are really remote sensing. And a lot of the data set that's really significant in the ends of the Earth is mostly uh, remote telemetry uh, and satellites. So a lot of the data sets are about 40 years old. They start in the late 70s, and that's really where I, I remember when I first was interested in the ice, uh, there was the big question was, what's the mass balance, and how would we ever know? Because how would we ever measure it? And so now there's a sense of we can measure it with satellites, and now there is a sense of it being known. And um, I spent a fair amount of time bringing some maps and posters up and, and when we run out of time and, and kind of check out and, and get to be uh, on the informal closure, uh, you're welcome to linger about and, and have a look at the walls. I brought some rock samples, I brought some other art, I brought a whole bunch of resource materials that I've collected over the years. Uh, some different artifacts that uh, people travel with as they organize their expeditions. But uh, here's the Antarctic from space, which seems to be where we really view everything now from the overview. And so um, I was it's like, oh, the ice, what's that? Well, uh, you know, this is really, uh, it's the seventh continent, it's a circular continent, it's uniquely uh, uh, isolated at the bottom of the world. And, the Drake Passage opened up, I think, uh, about 13, 15 million years ago, and uh, it was really when the Antarctic became isolated. So there's a circumpolar current that isolates the, co the continent. Uh, it's really, uh, even in ancient times, there was speculation that there's got to be something down there to balance the rest of the land masses up north, or the Earth would wobble. Kind of a, a silly concept, but. Uh, so it's about 97% ice covered. Uh, some of the ice is up to three miles thick. That's about as thick as it gets, but most people are kind, kind of really confounded by how there could be so much ice. So I've used metric units, 30 million cubic kilometers, uh, just because um, I think it's sad the way that in America we've stayed with our English units and it makes it so hard for us to uh, think in, in, in metric. And, and I, I don't think there was any mal intent with that, but I think it's really kind of detached us from the rest of the world and certainly the scientific community. And so I'm, I convert a bunch of units, but a lot of times uh, I, I kind of, I'm trying to train myself to think in, in metric. And now um, it's, all about, it's all about climate and is climate changing or is climate not changing and is climate changing why? And that's not really the central focus of 
uh, my emphasis tonight. It's really more of a, a, a reflective overview, but I, I do feel that I'm bearing witness to times uh, that are unique and remarkable times. So I, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll do some, I'll talk about the observations that are being made. Here's the floating, let's, it's mostly, I, what I really wanted to talk about is, is, is ice. So here's the East Antarctic ice sheet. This is elevation and flow. Here's sea level. These, these units of ice, these are the floating ice masses, the ice shelves. So when anybody ever says, oh, there's an ice shelf, that's a floating mass of glacial ice that's come off of the land and is now floating on an ocean. That's really quite significant uh, for change because two reasons, really. Uh, one, it doesn't displace seawater. If you think of your cocktail glass, I was trying to think of what's the, what's the metaphor to make for cocktails. You don't uh, fill your glass with your cocktail and then dump the ice in afterwards, do you? You do that maybe never. Right, okay. You fill a glass with a little bit of ice and you add orange juice, you add whatever you're gonna add. So we recognize that it's one of the unique things about water that makes life possible and, and kind of drives a lot of systems on the planet is that water changes density as it freezes and expands and becomes lighter and floats. So this, this massive ice, the Ross Ice Shelf, about the size of France, there's no threat to that in terms of like if that were to become detached and move out into the open ocean, which is a very unlikely event because it's anchored by three shores. It's overridden islands. This is Roosevelt Island. These are little islands that are overridden. So it's pretty well pinned. Uh, this is the um, Ron Filchner ice shelf. This is actually a little hunk of ice that's come off. This, is the, uh, this comes into play in a couple of slides. This is the Larsen ice shelf, A, B, and C. Uh, this has changed uh, remarkably, but what happens with ice shelf calving is that it unlocks the land ice behind it. That's really kind of the summary statement. So uh, the media, there's kind of problems with the media because everything's got to be sensationalized, everything's got to capture your attention, and, and the truth is often sort of uh, the first thing that's lost in that process, and, and we end up where we end up today, not being able to believe anything, and, and where does the truth lie? But uh, looking at the Antarctic continent uh, from the broader scale, I wanted to show it first without, I, without the sea ice and then uh, add the sea ice platform. The sea ice platform is really critical in many ways because actually the freezing process itself excludes salt, and so there's a density change in the water, and it actually creates a sinking motion, and this sinking motion creates the Antarctic bottom water, which is actually one of the main drivers and a really, really important driver to our ocean circulation system, none of which was really, really well understood when I first went to the Antarctic in the early 80s. Like the, I don't think the students at, in college to, at this time really recognized the advances that have been made in, in earth science and understanding, a lot of which is uh, related to technology and sensing. But what's valuable about the sea ice platform is that it protects the continent, it protects the ice shelves, and it also adds to the albedo. So it essentially doubles the size of the reflective surface that's important in keeping the frozen, the cryosphere part, the cryo is frozen earth, frozen water, it's part of the hydrosphere, but the cryosphere is all of the things that are frozen, mostly uh, water. There's also land and, and permafrost, but when we're talking about the cryosphere, we're talking about all of the frozen things on the earth. So uh, there's our uh, peninsula that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, this is a record high value. We were pretty excited in terms of uh, just staying caught up with what's going on in the Earth system is that it doesn't appear that there's a lot of change that's happening really abruptly uh, to sea ice in the Antarctic over the recent years. Uh, there's uh, appears that there may be some changes that are coming uh, to, the, to the sea ice platform uh, that are starting to be observed, but this is really distinctly different from the other end of the Earth, what's what we're observing up in the Arctic Ocean Basin that we'll get to in a minute. So I wanted to get something relatively recent. Here's January 1, and you have to realize that uh, if you travel to New Zealand or if you travel down under, that you really kind of need to flip your whole perspective on seasonality and think about the austral 
summer and the austral winter, that is the southern hemisphere season, are reversed than, uh, from ours. And so it's important to think of that when you're considering uh, what's the melt season and what's the growth season for sea ice and, and for glaciers. So. There's been some discussion um, in Washington that if we were able to move the continental United States to the Antarctic continent, that our southern border would be protected. Um, however, I mean, you can see that the Rio Grande, it's still, it's still unresolved. So, but for scale, uh, the five and a half million square miles of the Antarctic continent um, is roughly the United States and our neighbor to the South Mexico in, in area. So, uh, moving north a little bit, uh, a really distinct part of the Antarctic actually goes into sub uh, Antarctic latitudes, so that is north of the Antarctic Circle, so it's sub Antarctic, is really distinctly different from the frozen continent itself. The frozen continent has two ice shelves, the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, the Polar Plateau, and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Uh, the peninsula itself has quite a bit less uh, frozen water, glacial ice stored, really only about, uh, oh, um, oh, 0.4 of a, a, a foot in terms of uh, sea level rise. But it distinct, it, the, here's the, uh, the Larsen embayment here. And this is A, B, and C. And it's kind of nice that nature was so cooperative in terms of the way this is disintegrated in CAV being kind of in chronological and alphabetical order. So <laughs> starting from north and going south, as you might expect if there was warming. And if you uh, do uh, temperature observations, of which uh, there's a rich data set, uh, there are temperature observations that are uh, available that show that there's warming in the Antarctic Peninsula area. If you go uh, back a little ways and you go all the way into the interior, the really wonderful thing that makes Antarctica so mysterious is that this eastern Antarctica may be actually accruing or accreting or still gathering uh, mass in terms of storing uh, glacial ice. The West Antarctic Ice Sheet, I first learned about in 1980 uh, at science lectures down on the ice. This is Ross Island. This is where the primary American station is. We'll see that up close in a minute or two. But on, down on Ross Island and McMurdo Station, they were saying, oh, yes, well, if the West Antarctic Ice Sheet ever goes, there's great potential for sea level rise. Uh, the, the unique thing about the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, here's the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range. So everything to the east is the Polar Plateau. The Antarctic is the continent of superlatives. It's the highest, coldest, driest, windiest, most remote. And it really is all of those things. Uh, but if you get west of the uh, Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range, you're in a different country altogether as far as the ice terrain. And much of this ice is overlying bedrock that's well below sea level. And so it's thought of as a marine-based ice sheet. So it's much more susceptible to changes, thermal changes in the ocean environment. So there is some potential for dynamic change in the West Antarctic ice sheet. And we've seen that. We saw that at the end of the last century, and we're seeing it at the beginning of this new millennium uh, with the collapse of the Larsen. And uh, this is just the tip, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. I was really excited. Uh, um, when these things happen because they were so uh, captivating to me. The scale of them is so immense. So you can see some grounding line. You actually see calving fronts here. Uh, this, these are some noon attacks. These are overridden uh, land islands here. And then the peninsula is behind to the west in this image. Uh, just for scale, and it's kind of disappointing, it's just the size of Rhode Island. I mean, you know, and, we're thankful it's not the size of Arizona or France. But what really caught the glaciologists by surprise and really woke up the uh, glacial science community was the nature of the way this mass of ice changed. And it changed over a six week period. And, and when I was a kid, you know, the pace of glacial change when we wanted to talk about things, oh, that's slow. 
And so now that's kind of been flipped on its head. And so now we recognize that the pace of glacial change can, uh, can vary over time, can change very quickly over time, and can increase or decrease quickly over time. And, and what happened here, uh, let's see, this is the embayment now that it's free of ice. And what happened in the Larsen was uh, essentially meltwater on the surface and summertime sun elevations, 24 hours daylight. So you had meltwater accumulating in crevasses, meltwater making its way into and eventually through crevasses. And there's two things that happens there. Really, it's the addition of the heat that's important because when the water is liquid, it's possessing a lot of energy if it's in contact with the ice. The ice is trying to freeze it, and if it does so, a lot of energy is going to be absorbed in, in the process. If it does freeze, well, then there's that expansion is happening. So it's both the heat of the meltwater being able to penetrate deeper into the ice, the floating ice mass, and also in refreezing environments, it's, uh, it's freezing and, and wedge action. So post-calving event, uh, there was some, this, a lot of this uh, science was done by uh, flyby, by aviation. I really like this slide because it shows you glacial basins. So here's, uh, in the sense of a watershed, these are glacier sheds. So this is where this unit 14 is going to drain out in this direction. And this unit 13 is going to drain out in this direction. And so they've tried to quantify that. And then you take aircraft that have airborne uh, radar, you fly across these uh, these glaciers, you do that again on another year, and you determine a flow rate. And there was actually good data set prior to this, these calving events, and uh, it was determined. I used the lower number. There was a number that I saw that was three to eight times faster than prior to the disintegration of the Larsen ice shelf, and I, I went with the lower figure. I went to uh, four to five times greater. So uh, the good news is it slowed right down. So. That's the example of the calving of an ice shelf allowing land ice to accelerate, and the good news being that it might uh, also have a, just a, a period where it's accelerated and then, and then slow right down. So, kind of changing gears, uh, this was the world's largest iceberg at one time, the B-15 uh, icebergs are there's kind of named like storms. They have a special nomenclature. This one is already calved once, so it was 183 miles long. Uh, they tend to be very long and very narrow. They're, they're narrow in relationship to their length just because of the way they calve, and sometimes they take years to calve. But uh, this one blocked off uh, access to a uh, penguin work rookery on the north tip of uh, Ross Island for a year and just devastated it penguin population, it was tragic. And this ice tongue gets, gets us to our, our next kind of piece in the ice nomenclature and ice glossary, but this is really a, an example of a really poor image of the Drygalski ice tongue because it's under cloud right now. But this uh, uh, world's largest iceberg that just calved off of the Bay of Wales over by Roosevelt Island uh, in March of 2000 is gonna uh, crater into the Drygalski. And there was quite a bit of concern about that at that time, uh, because look at how big that is. I mean, that in itself is a pretty big floating mass of, of ice. But again, this is all in equilibration with sea level. There's no threat to sea level change here. But I just like this North Victoria Land Coast. You can see all of these uh, different glaciers that come out. And this is probably the, one of the longest ice tongues on the whole Antarctic continent. There's the hunk that it broke off. Here's uh, Ross Island by comparison, and, and this iceberg would absolutely squish and override and obliterate Ross Island. Uh, for, for example, here's quite a small ice tongue, the Erebus ice tongue, uh, and the McMurdo Station, the American base where we're, we're uh, stationed is, is down at the tip of uh, what's known as uh, Hut Point Peninsula. I was just checking on this iceberg uh, the other day. Uh, it's now, uh, it, it made it all the way around the continent and then drifted north out of the Weddell Sea and has, uh, is in the South Georgia vicinity. 
and is thought to be kind of, it's now uh, B15Z. Uh, so it's had a lot of things break off of it, and it's thought to be in its sort of death throes. They don't get uh, that far north in latitude because they, they just melt. They cool a bit of the ocean, as you might imagine, uh, but mostly these big tabular icebergs are really normal cavity. They're normal glacial mechanical events. The question would be, how frequently do they occur? Um, so it's not like they do happen every other day. And there's not a great body of data to look back at. Uh, here's a new one. Uh, just a couple years ago, uh, this is the Larsen C, and uh, it's the new largest. So it's 5,000 square kilometers, and it just, it took, but it did take, it took uh, three years to go crack here all the way through. And then this is um, a 68A. This is uh, the first little hunk that broke off of it. So uh, you can tell, whenever you're looking at images of the Antarctic, you can kind of tell how old they are by the hunks of ice that have broken off and are now missing. So a lot of the, the things that are on the wall and a lot of the images that you'll see online are actually quite old with respect to changes in the coastline from changes in, uh, in the calving events around the, the continent. So uh, although the big bergs make a big splash, they're not necessarily, is Antarctica coming unglued? That was one of my favorite uh, headlines. Now, here we are in the frozen ocean. This is, uh, I had a life as a fisherman. We were flying down my first year and looking out the window, everything's frozen. The guy's like, hey, what are you gonna do down there? And it's like, oh, I'm gonna fish. And the guy's like, oh, huh, yeah, right. And um, I just wanted to throw a few images in here because I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the Antarctic Ocean and freezing and, uh, and a little bit about the fish, but then we have to move to the north and kind of keep moving. Uh, well, kind of an anecdote, uh, it, the continent of superlatives, it also has the uh, greatest underwater visibility of all the oceans on the planet. So the underwater visibility in the Antarctic Ocean, the Southern Ocean, is limited by available light. Uh, the anecdote that I have is a gentleman, Rob Robbins, who I used to work with, uh, down in McMurdo, who's been a, a lifetime commercial diver. So he's uh, over a thousand dives, he's over 30 years in, and, and he's reporting turbidity. So his observed experience is that the clarity that we've come to appreciate so much, that's such an aesthetic thing that draws a guy in for his entire commercial career life as a diver is kind of now changing. So uh, the turbidity is thought to just be with uh, a little more dynamic uh, activity uh, with ice near the shores. But this is kind of the primary productivity, I guess you'd say, or the base of the food chain. This is like a diatomaceous kind of uh, plant material that's uh, uh, what the krill uh, feed off of. And so this is underneath the ice. It's usually like two meters thick. This is the brash ice. And so these things are salt concentrations. Salt, um, essentially they're exclusions. The salt, the brine is excluded from the fresh water it, and the, the water as it freezes becomes fresher and fresher, excludes salt, changes the density of the water immediately around it, creates heavier water because now the immediate water next to the freezing water is much higher in salinity and so it's sinking. So this freezing thing that happens around that continent and underneath these ice shelves that happens annually is a really, really important piece of the kind of the bottom of our uh, our ocean circulation system. Uh, and we loved observing that. This is about a meter in diameter. This is our, our fishing hole. Those are uh, native little bork ravinks down there. That's an actual fish. I have a bunch of images that are not very clear in this uh, presentation, unfortunately. But this is ice that's continuing to grow. This is the brash, brash, brash ice. And uh, it was important to me to talk about both the ice and the fish because uh, there's some important, important things to say about the fish. Um, the thing about the, that's wonderful about the ice is how complex uh, nature com becomes so quickly when you start to take a look at it. It just, uh, it doesn't defy logic. It, it, it's very logical and it's very physical, but it becomes quite complex. This is a guest scientist. This is Charles Knight. He's the, kind of a leading researcher. He's out of Boulder. Boulder, Colorado, um, 
uh, University of uh, Colorado at Boulder is really uh, one of the leading uh, research areas in the United States for the cryosphere and for all things frozen. And, uh, uh, the freezing of supercooled liquids is really his, his uh, specialty. So here you have ice floating by. What's happening in the Antarctic Ocean is there's little ice crystals all year long. And the freezing points depress to about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, about minus 1.79 C due to the salinity. And it's a very stable thermal mass. And so when changes are observed in the Antarctic Ocean, the further south they're observed, the more significant they'll be because this has been really the refrigerator zone for our climate really for uh, a whole period, well, since the Antarctic continent became uh, isolated like 15 million years ago. And these uh, crystals just kind of crash into each other cra and then nucleate on our fishing cable. That's a 532nd stainless steel cable that runs down 500 meters. That's the depth of the uh, McMurdo Sound right there. So it's about 1,600 feet. The fish that we're looking for, the Antarctic cod, which is only a not, it's only a, a term that you use to uh, communicate to the public. This is the Waddell seal. And you can imagine the uh, you know, air-breathing mammal is really going to love any uh, penetration, any perforation, any hole in the ice is like a miracle for these animals. And so they'll come up and breathe and watch you and kind of interfere with your entire operation for an hour and a half. And there's nothing that you can do but appreciate them. <laughs> because they're absolutely wonderful. And then uh, occasionally they'll eat your fish on the way up too. So they get a pretty good meal out of the deal. Uh, and, and yeah, we had some neighboring scientists who wanted to uh, collaborate with us and use our hole uh, and, and try and keep uh, some of these seal seals isolated and do uh, diving studies on them and learn about the mammalian diving reflex was kind of an interesting thing that related to some improvements in uh, mammalian uh, uh, sudden infant crib death, actually. So here we are with the moss and I now. Uh, the disgust, the Sosticus moss and I is the, the common name. The Antarctic cod is a misnomer. It's not actually in the cod family. It's a toothfish. It's a nototheanoid, so it's a, in the toothfish family. And the reason why I, I, I wanted to have this uh, in the presentation tonight was this is really what got me to the south, and I, was, I, I stayed. It was four seasons that I did this fishing, and uh, we tried not to fall through the ice. We tried not to get bit by the fish. There was, it's so fascinating uh, trying, to do, trying to do anything in these environments. Uh, it's quite often about twice the energy. And in that era in the uh, Antarctic, there was nothing that anyone was ever allowed to do. And so we were allowed to take people fishing with us. And so we were kind of the most popular people in town because anybody wanted to do, everybody wanted to do something. And it's like, oh, well, you are allowed to go fishing or you can go to the bar. And so, so we had a lot of people come out and, and, and that was a really wonderful thing. But there were some real hazards with the fish uh, if you got your hands in the wrong place. So they averaged about um, 1.3 meters and they averaged about 64 pounds. And in the early days, we were doing kind of population surveys. So we were doing as intensive fishing as, as we could. We would uh, do catch and release. We would tag and catch and release. And uh, we would occasionally collect animals and take them back to that aquarium. And uh, essentially, they're cold-blooded animals that are living below the freezing point. So how do they do that? And that turns out to be an interesting biochemical story that has to do with a glycopeptide antifreeze that is present throughout their body tissues, including their blood, and um, actually turns out has some application in agriculture and kind of freezing avoidance for plants if you spray just right very close into the uh, freezing point. There's not a big range here. If you uh, get to minus uh, 2.5, this fish is going to freeze solid. But the fish can actually live uh, with ice crystals uh, in its system and this uh, antifreeze will essentially has an affinity based on the, its crystal lattice to attach to growing ice crystals in the fish and allow the fish to uh, basically 
uh, sequester that growing crystal so it doesn't interfere with its biology. It's a great story. We, uh, I think it's 500 of these I handled one year. Uh, and is uh, about 30,000 pounds is uh, kind of a reason why it's, it's a little hard on my back now. <laughs> but we kind of have to get up to the north because there's so much that's uh, in the north as well. Um, this is the Mediterranean Ocean Basin of uh, the Arctic Ocean Basin. Uh, I'll kind of go out on a limb and call this a, a Mediterranean Sea because it's very important to recognize that uh, it is completely different from the south. Uh, and, and when you check on the literature, they'll, they'll describe them as opposites. So instead of having a landmass that's kind of balancing the planet, you don't, you don't have a landmass, you have a, an Arctic Ocean. And the North Pole's just about here, and things are kind of heating up in the uh, polar regions, as you know, geopolitically. Uh, there's the northern sea route as a result of retreat in the sea ice. It's kind of interesting how we can live in this culture where it's not uh, politically or socially acceptable or safe to talk about climate change. And yet, in the very next breath, uh, climate change is like one of the dominating uh, news stories. And the practical realities of climate change are really being planned for by nation states across the planet right now. So I think the United States, we're in a fairly unique position that uh, uh, may, may be kind of challenging for us at some point. But I was surprised to see that this is really only about 3% of the Earth's surface. So that, that was a surprise to me. And why, why do we really care? Uh, I think one, the, re the real reason why I care is, um, is that uh, I'm living these changes. I'm experiencing these changes in ways that I had no idea I ever would. Uh, so the frozen Arctic Ocean, if you imagine, that's bright to look at right here. If we talk about reflectivity or albedo, that's kind of the key. You know, the big, big concept I know is not news to anyone in this room, but it's kind of almost like polar opposites. This is the most reflective substance on the planet, really. Fresh white snow on top of ice is reflective of about 80 or 85% of the incoming solar radiation. There definitely is some wavelengths that get into the snow cover, and there's a whole mechanics uh, behind that. There's physics there. But if you remove that, then the rate of absorption is about 80%, and that's about as absorptive of any material that's on the planet. So this polar opposite kind of thing between to have ocean sea ice or to have open ocean is really proving to be, I think that's what's going to really be something that will allow us to talk about changes more openly because the changes will be happening so quickly. And as a result of uh, these retreats in, in Arctic Ocean ice, uh, Greenland is warming. So we care about Greenland because it's the other ice sheet. It's only about a tenth the size of the Antarctic ice sheet, but it's enough to raise sea level. It's a, a range that's given, but it's uh, oh, six to uh, 20 feet. So that's a pretty big range. 20, at six feet is probably manageable. Um, so here we have, this is great in there. Let's look at this March 13th. Here we are, we're kind of, we're at the peak We've passed the peak of the uh, season in the high Arctic now, and so the Arctic Ocean ice is starting to retreat. But uh, what's quite often overlooked is the rest of this um, snow-covered terrain. Look at how beautifully white that whole uh, part of the globe is. So that is perhaps not as reflective, but it's really important to recognize that the snow-covered land terrain is equally important to the uh, moderating the Earth's climate system as the frozen uh, sea ice is. So. Uh, the world's uh, largest island will get you in trouble. A lot of people want to talk about Australia. That's great. It's just kind of semantics. It doesn't really, the Greenlanders like to think that it's the world's largest island. So uh, why argue? This, this is the, uh, summit area, the summit ridge of the Greenland ice sheet is actually uh, not so much in the center of the island as it's slightly further to the east. Uh, 
it's called the inland ice. So if you go there, um, that's how it's going to be referred to. So instead of calling it the Greenland ice sheet, I usually refer to it as the inland ice. And that's just the, the, the local term. Because everywhere you go inland, there's the ice. <laughs> so. But if you, take, if, you, if you look down here, uh, the total volume, like 3 million cubic kilometers, I kinda, that's a, a good figure because that is about a tenth of what you have on this, the frozen southern continent. So the fact that all that ice is uh, frozen in the uh, southern continent, about 90% of the Earth's ice is down in the Antarctic continent. This is much, much less, but uh, this uh, sleeping giant is much more active. So here's the Arctic Circle. Here's the town Kangalushwak. This is kind of the research base. Uh, if people remember the Cold War, all of us that are um, a little older veterans, people that served, this is uh, Sonderstrom Fjord. So if you're familiar with Sonderstrom Fjord, it was uh, sold or given to the Danes for a dollar uh, back in the uh, late 60s and uh, with the condition that we would always keep the airport, that the airport would stay open. Eric the Red kind of gets a bad rap. Uh, Greenland's kind of the uh, initial like, hey, well, it was marketing. We're going to call it Greenland and everybody will want to go. But having been uh, this southern tip uh, is really where the Vikings were first able to make landfall. Uh, and this is uh, Im important to recognize that this is the medieval warm period. So if you're looking at little pulses in the Earth's climate system, this was a, a warm period. And, and when you get into um, the Little Ice Age, the uh, Vikings are frozen out. So it's closer. This uh, is a geologic map. And Greenland's actually a little closer related to North America than it is to Europe in terms of uh, tectonic origin. Some of the oldest rocks on the, actually the oldest exposed rocks on the, on the surface of the Earth are down here around Nuuk, the country's capital. There's about 57,000 people live here. Uh, it's only about 85% ice covered and it's uh, changing pretty quickly. So here's Eric's the Red. Uh, and the, the nice thing about the, the Norse, as uh, Doug would testify, uh, the, the history is so good because of the sagas. There's just so much written history that you can actually know who was marrying who and when. And uh, Eric the Red definitely fell afoul of the law, and they, they tossed him out of there. And uh, he went and discovered Greenland inadvertently because that's the way the, the winds were blowing. So here's a, a little bit of glacial terrain. This is an example of smaller scale. So this is, this is probably like less than a mile. But um, now that people are looking more closely at the cryosphere and tidewater glaciers and, and, and glaciers that are interacting with ocean water are thought to be, well, the term that the media would like would be the canary in the coal mine. They're the most sensitive to changes. So if the ocean temperature is changing, uh, it's often uh, affecting the ice uh, on the basal plane underneath the, the floating mass or the grounding line will be retreating. But if you look at this moraine, this, I love this image because of the nature of this moraine. This is probably you know, a good 500 vertical feet. So there's been a lot of retreat, but that could be 10,000 years of retreat. So that's not yesterday's retreat. And there's a calving. I just love the ice-free terrain uh, and the, the snow-free ice in the ablation in the, in the lower reaches of the glacial environment. You have annual melting where snow completely leaves the ice cover. And you can see the flow lines very clearly. And there's just magic in watching these different moraines coming down. And some of the valley glaciers that are quite wide are just filled with these little strips of earth that are really quite fun to look at. So this is uh, Kangalushwak town. This is the Watson River. This is uh, about 1% of the Greenland ice sheet. This is uh, the bridge that goes across to the uh, Lake Ferguson, the water source. This was uh, uh, a World War II base that was created uh, for the uh, American push to get to Europe and, and the Allied uh, uh, work in the war. So there was eight stations, eight uh, uh, airports that were set up quite quickly in the World War II period, and three of them still survive. This is what uh, going in the field looks like. This must be tent day. You check everything out. This is the warehouse 
up in Kangalushwak, you set everything up, you take a look at everything. We're gonna go out with a group and actually do a, a unique thing where we're gonna travel by snow machine and uh, look at the surface snow. So and we get to travel about 300 kilometers. This is a slightly better day that we've battled some of the things away. And you spend about a week uh, getting ready to go because um, once you go, then you're out there. Here's some drilling equipment. Uh, most everything goes in relatively hard boxes. Uh, this is another sister group that's working on kind of the same thing over here. Um, this is our landing area. Um, back to the kind of military industrial history, this is part of the dew line, if you recognize the distant early warning. Uh, when it was on the ice sheet, it was called the die. I'm not sure what the acronym is for, but uh, through some confusion and bureaucratic kind of snafus, this station was abandoned uh, for insurance reasons and then froze and was destroyed. So it, it makes kind of a good story that the Danes will tell you because as a result of it being on Greenland, the Americans had to make some concession to be there. And so this is where some of the first ice cores were taken was uh, uh, kind of locations of opportunity. Where you can get to is where you can do science. So just being, because remote sensing is really taking over the day, uh, there'll be times when uh, the, one of the questions is, how will future scientists relate to nature if all they re relate to is remote sensing? So I have a couple little clips, and I don't know, they're just silly little clips, but this is now we're ready to get out of town, and believe it or not, that whole aircraft is for our group, and so we're gonna pile in there, and uh, it takes off on wheels and it lands on skis. So its type, it would be a skier. Uh, uh, by radio call, it's called a, a skier because uh, it's a unique type of aircraft. It's the Hercules, it's the C-130. And this is a pretty poor picture of the base, but if we make it all the way through to the, the flood um, that comes down uh, in 2012 and starts to take out this bridge, this is the glacial uh, this is the runout zone. This is the glacial outwash plain. This is sea level. Here's the last little vestige going up to the ice sheets about uh, 15 miles away. Uh, there's the runway, and there's a little airport over here. These are navigator noon attacks. This is kind of a historic. A, a lot of veterans, uh, uh, service members, and, and airmen that uh, traveled over to Greenland. It's a really, really hard place to fly to safely, and there's a rich, rich history in, in uh, aircraft that didn't make it. But when they saw these three noon attacks, the noon attack being something that is a uh, ice-free terrain surrounded by uh, ice, so it's a, a rock surrounded by a glacier, uh, they knew they were on their way. All they had to do was go down this fjord. And then I think this might be a video. Yeah, so this is inside the herd. It's uh, typically a loud environment. Um, that's all survival gear. Uh, for the air crew, it's kind of nice. You can actually go up onto the flight deck. Um, it's it's really very different um, than uh, commercial aviation in the United States, where we're all thought of to be a security risk. Uh, once you make it through and you're on the aircraft, you're just one of the persons, and you follow the air crew's uh, directions. But um, it's usually a pretty adventurous ride, and you're very excited because of where you're going. And this is what your pallet, this is what your kit looks like. It's not exactly traveling light. So if you're thinking of the leave no trace or the pure nature travel, this is not the right career field. Um, that was one of two, and then we had a, a bunch of other stuff. But as a result of that die site being there, uh, the uh, Air National Guard maintains an airstrip, and as a result of that, there's a little baby camp there that uh, uh, folks get to run all season long. So this is the Raven camp that's at die two and that creates a research platform because it's a place that you can fly to. So we packed up the next day and, and, and headed out, um, and we were gonna go, oh, I think about uh, 80 kilometers. And this is uh, Clement Meige. This is one of the things that uh, uh, glacial science is all about now. Uh, ice is transparent to radar for the most part. So the, the field of radar and glaciology is really, really rich. And so what Clement does is runs a radar track every time we're going anywhere. And then eventually what we did was we took a radar track 
that was then going to be overflown by one of the airborne radars. Here's our camp in place. You set everything up in the direction that you think the prevailing wind is going to be, uh, and you, you set everything uh, uh, essentially perpendicular to that. Then when the prevailing wind does come along, uh, it creates drifting, but you don't drift your own things in. So there's actually quite a science to how you set up your camps, and it's wall-to-wall -wall nonstop work. It's, it's definitely uh, full-time camping. There's some relaxing times when you're in the storms, uh, as long as the storms themselves are relaxing, but sometimes they're not. So the little antenna, every, the ubiquitous uh, GPS, everything, there's not a research method out there that uh, doesn't res uh, involve uh, global positioning and GIS now. So that's a great field. This is our uh, Italian weather technician, Federico Colvi, out of the uh, University of Fairbanks in Alaska. He's a doctoral candidate and uh, was setting up remote sensing uh, uh, weather stations that would log all year long. The tents, uh, the nice thing about the wind and the drifting is after your tent, uh, if your tent survives initially, you're going to be fine because it's going to be completely buried by snow and then it's no longer going to blow away. So. It just becomes a digging exercise and it's really a digging lifestyle. And, and um, uh, you know, Bob said, what did you do and what was your job description? And, and I've always said, you know, I was really the guy with the snow shovel. And there's the snow shovels there. And believe it or not, you actually take pretty good care of where these shovels are in case you do end up uh, completely drifted into your tent. Uh, these are little 10 by 10. Uh, this was a base camp. These are one tent per person. That's a restroom. Uh, and then everything is flagged. So in the event that you're out in a whiteout, um, you can run into a rope instead of just kind of go on free will. So here's uh, our weather stations complete. Getting set up to do a core. Let's see, I think this has actually got some audio. Here but, we uh, are. Federico is making the weather station. We've got our drill set up for the next core. And uh, Regina, Johnny, and Clem are analyzing the core sections. All going well. That's uh, Sasha Liebman. Who the, this crew is currently just deployed. They just uh, are in the field for their last, uh, their last season now. So onto the core, you can see uh, scientists can read backwards and upside down, kind of a good sign. Uh, this is, gets to be quite meticulous, but what are they doing and why uh, is the real question. This is the fern. So fern is old snow or multi-year snow. Uh, fern is snow that's densifying and slowly becoming glacial ice. And how long does that process take and what happens in the meantime have become important research questions. The actual important research question is now that warming's observed, there's melting at higher elevations on the ice sheet. So there's surface water around. So the real research that's interesting right now that's happening is all about hydrology of the surface of the glacier or the near surface conditions. And so here, the idea is that the fern, the snow itself, has the opportunity to store as a reservoir a lot of melt. And the other question is, how long will it do that and what will stop it from doing that? And it's these ice lenses. So the actual quantification, what we're doing there is, um, is density. So we're doing length, we're doing width, we're doing weighing for each of these core sections down to about 25 meters. So that's a, usually a day or two uh, or uh, an impossibly challenging task depending upon the mood of the drill. So I wanted to throw a couple of these in. Here's an example of an ice lens. And then there's ice at the bottom here. And then here they're keeping track, just a simple, this is 5, 10, this looks like core number 15. It was a two meter barrel, so on a good day you might get a core that would be slightly longer than a meter. But um, the fascinating thing is that the fern has the capacity to insulate meltwater so that it overwinters as liquid. And that was a shock. 
So that was a direct observation one day when it was 15 degrees centigrade below on the surface, and they pulled up water. And you can imagine the thrill if you're the field party and you're trying to keep everything from freezing, and then suddenly all of your mechanical stuff is like drenched with melt. So that was a, a surprising finding and an example of why you got to go there, why you got to do these things. So the idea is that the thermal properties of fern are such that if meltwater penetrates far enough below the surface that it's protected from the overwintering cold temperatures, it may survive into the next summer season as water. And will that be significant for subsequent runoff? That's kind of the question that they're asking. So now we're uh, another couple meters deep, deeper than the previous, and we're back into fern. So fern's very porous, and fern is what's trapping the uh, gases that will become relevant to the paleoclimatologists when they're doing the deep cores that we'll take a look at as we try and cruise through here. So we had to measure every little section of core, and then, um, then we would uh, chuck them in the melt pot at night. And this was fun. These were some uh, private, uh, private expedition saw us on the horizon and uh, happened by and uh, stopped and chatted with us. So people actually crossed the Greenland ice sheet for fun on purpose at great expense and through tremendous logistics. And I, I, I was amazed by the number of people that we ran into that season. The fun thing is these people were French, and, and one of our senior scientists, Clement Mege, is a, a French national, and so he could chat them up in his native tongue and was able to give us all the data. Um, this is a little more of a, a routine. We, we had so much, um, we had a lot of extra time for this. So. Sasha actually crunched a bunch of numbers to say, oh, this is how much field time we have because about 50% of the field time should be uh, in, uh, down uh, due to environmental, due to storms. And we didn't find that to be true at all. We had very good weather with the exception of uh, oh, about half a dozen of those kind of blows. But what's interesting is you get these really fascinating downwind uh, drifts that were fascinating to us because they're on an ice sheet that's otherwise completely flat. So it's like, wow. But you go out to crawl around in the middle of the storm, and then suddenly you're falling over because the topography's changed in the last 20 minutes. And you actually kind of have to be careful because you're in zero visibility, and it could be like a meter's drop that's fairly sheer, and you're just kind of going, whoa. So. And then we pack it up, and then we move on. And we had three of these sites over the course of a 21-day period. So this particular group had way too much time planned in the field. Uh, we didn't really need this much time. This was the first year in their three-year evolution. Now they're uh, two years later. They're quite a bit uh, uh, more streamlined, less stuff, more efficient. Uh, and, and we were on the, the, first, uh, the first year, so we were kind of uh, learning as we went. And uh, this is quite a treat, to actually drive across the flat white at great length on a good day is really remarkable. Now, on a cloudy day, when you're driving inside a ping pong ball, or it feels like um, you're really inside a, a, like a milk container, um, it's a fascinating experience because uh, there's your vertigo and your nausea, and there's your disorientation. and um, your perception, you're in an environment where you know you can't trust your perception. So it's like, oh, I think I see this. I think I see the surface. I think this is, and it's like, oh, no, 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 you don't, that's not right. You have to kind of second guess yourself. So we made it back in, and uh, we waited like a week to get picked up. And uh, we thoroughly explored this little area, which is kind of like doing archaeology. So if you're ever on top of the Greenland ice sheet, or most of the skiers aim at this, giant golf ball on the horizon because it's something to shoot at. It's something they can see, so they go for it. So I saw, believe it or not, I, I mean, all, they're all Norwegians. All the Norwegians went across Greenland. Probably I ran into about 100 people here. And it's like, well, why have an ice skied across the ice sheet? So, uh, so we'll stay on the drilling thread for a, a little bit. And then I, I think I'll kind of uh, wrap it up and, and, and go into questions. Uh, after we get through with uh, the coring and, and see how people are doing. But uh, they've actually 
ice coring is kind of a foundation in paleoclimatology now. And paleoclimatology is sort of expanded uh, into an array of dating systems and sampling methods that allow dates to be cross-compared and correlated ac across all kinds of different sediment cores out of lakes, sediment cores out of the near shore environment, dendrochronology out of trees in the recent environment. Uh, and, and the age of the ice actually, they found ice that's over two million years old. And so can you really do a lot dating wise and, and uh, chemistry wise with ice that's two million years old? I can't actually comment on that from an informed place, but the hole that was drilled in the Greenland ice sheet that we'll take a look at as we close is actually really solid, uh, literally and metaphorically, uh, for about 110,000 years before present. And so it gives us a really clear signal, if you're inclined, to compare uh, previous climates and pre previous values in the atmosphere with our current values in the atmosphere and, and kind of look at what might happen. So these are the sacred cutter heads. These guys that are drillers, they are like the most eccentric people on the planet. And they're really fascinating. And uh, they really care about this thing, the cable and the drill. Oh my gosh, it's just phenomenal working with them. And these guys were actually drilling for uh, volcanic sulfites. Now we do know that if there's volcanic eruptions, which kind of might be good news at some point because sulfites injected high into the atmosphere, if they make it to the stratosphere, you get kind of a nuclear winter effect and you actually have cooling. You'll have cooling for a number of years. And so if you end up with that in the uh, snow cover and down in the ice core, it gives you an accurate lens. It gives you a real reference so you can date, say, oh, this is Krakatoa. This was 1884. So that's fairly thrilling for the, uh, the volcanologists. There's the core barrel. This was a two-meter core. This, uh, this is what holds the chips. There's the cutter head. This was a relatively shallow core. I think it was 300, uh, it was 300 meters. So this is the core, com the uh, flight coming off. And then there's always going to be the core table off to the side. So that's your core. And uh, this was uh, drilling for joy. This group had uh, completed their sample successfully. They'd reached the depth they needed to reach. But when you have a, a season and, and the amount of investment it is to get all this material set up, well, you keep it running for a little while and you practice, and you change things, and you experiment, and you bring the community out. And so they're like, oh, Steve, come on out and drill a core. I'm like, oh, really? I can come out and drill, drill a core? Oh, yeah. So um, there it is. And you can tell that um, this is not science core. This is no longer core that is relevant to the research project, why it's there. Uh, or it would be all packaged. It would be completely uh, labeled it would be uh, in quite a different environment. But uh, this is the, the American core box. Uh, our American system of ice core transit is uh, we use longer core boxes than the Europeans we, so we can transport cores that are a meter in length. And they mostly end up uh, in Denver, Colorado. And you can actually, if you make arrangements and you want to go and you want to hold a 400,000 year old piece of ice, you could probably do so. And if you did so with your class of young uh, elementary or second uh, secondary school students, they inspire another generation of scientists. So this is wrapping it up. This is getting the cores ready to go out. Um, that's a Air Force pallet ready to go. And then this is the proverbial cold deck. The thrill and adventure in ice core science is that after you have the sample and you've worked so hard to get it, well, it's just waiting to have nature take its course and melt. That's the next thing that's going to happen to your ice core sample. And a lot of ice core samples, if you get them even above uh, minus 20, you're starting to compromise some of the chemistry of the atmospheric contents of the gas bubbles that you're going to run your analysis on. But the trapped atmospheric gases are really accepted as a good proxy and, in fact, a direct sample of ancient uh, atmospheres. So that's become uh, more important to us as we see kind of changes in our current atmospheric composition. So here's the Greenland Ice uh, Sheet Project 2. That was the American core that was taken. And here you see 
even at uh, 1,855 meters, they can resolve annual rings just by uh, visually. The other way it's done is by uh, oxygen isotopes. The other way that it's done is by dust and electrical conductivity. So there's, two, there's like three or four different dating methods that are all compared and contrasted uh, to essentially date the core. And now we're just a little less deep. Um, there's all kinds of fascinating things to describe about ice cores. One of the favorite things for uh, the core community to do is when they have a core that they are done with is you give it to kids and you put it into orange juice and it does us, it's carbonated. It, because the, ice, the gas bubbles are under pressure, they'll melt and kind of do a crack, snapple, pop thing. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about that for the ice core drillers in the science community is when you pull these cores out, they're ready to like shatter because you've brought them up from beneath the surface at tremendous pressure. Now that pressure's all relieved. So special dispensation is made and you'll actually build whole trenches where you'll store these cores uh, for the better part of six months to let them relax and then you can actually measure changes in density and size in the core after that time. So, But let's just take one look at what a little data would show uh, with respect to atmosphere gases and, and temperature. And this is the Vostok core, and there's great stories to tell about the, the Russians at Vostok. This is the Russian station. The Russians wanted to be at South Pole, but we tricked them and we said, why don't you guys go over to Vostok at the Pole of Inaccessibility? It's a really hard place to get to and we'll take the South Pole. And, and the Russians were like, yes, we can do anything difficult. You Americans need it easy. And so they did and we ended up at the Pole, which is a great spot geographically, but it's fairly nondescript uh, in terms of what's going on glacially there. But underneath Vostok, they discovered the world's largest subglacial lake. There's a body of water, liquid water underneath the Vostok station that totally aroused the Americans. Suddenly we were like flying in there and bringing food and it's like, hey, can we be your friends? And can we have you not drill into this lake and completely contaminate it? And the Russians are like, you Americans, whatever. No, they were very accommodating. But what we really want to end with, I think, or, or kind of I'll close this part and, and kind of go to questions to respect the clock, is that when you have a graph that kind of matches, so here's temperature, uh, changes in temperature. So it's not a literal temperature. That's one of the challenging things about some of the data is you're measuring warm versus cold or a, amount of change. So this is a delta. Uh, here's parts per million by volume of carbon dioxide uh, from the 400,000 year old uh, Vostok ice. And it snows so little that ice accumulates slowly and thus creates a older column of glacial ice. But the way the peaks, uh, it's, I, I find it compelling that the peaks in temperature kind of are, they're pretty much, until you get to like the very bottom where sometimes ice cores are disturbed by movement uh, in the glacial ice, that's why you try and drill on a divide or on a summit area. Uh, but if for the past 300 to 325,000 years ago, uh, we haven't had any uh, carbon dioxide values close to what they are today, um, as we're above 400 right now, uh, 280 being kind of uh, the range of kind of what we saw um, over time in the, in the record. But it, it corresponds with the, the warm periods. So. That's, uh, that's what the paleoclimatology is all about. That's their bread and butter. They live for that. And is that fake news? What can you believe? What can you not believe anymore? You know, that's really your judgment, your call, I, I think. But um, Bob, you think I should stop? Should I take some questions? Okay. So um, yeah, that's where we got to. And when you have such an investment, you maintain it. So here's the gist core, the borehole now. It's quite valuable to be able to drop a thermistor, a temperature uh, probe or sensor, or an array that might have one every 100 meters all the way down to depth. And you can measure the entire temperature profile of the Greenland ice sheet. 
and you can measure the bed, and you can discover that the bed of the ice sheet is different than the bed of the Antarctic ice sheet, and that this bed is at the melting point. So this is a wet glacier, versus if you go to the Antarctic and you're the East Antarctic, you're going to go all the way to the bed, and it's still going to be frozen. Kind of good news in terms of stability versus uh, dynamic conditions. And these were, uh, we had some guests, these are the National Science Foundation heavies that uh, fund all this. So anyway, thank you. I knew that we were not going to cover the whole world in my whole life. <laughs> Sir. I would have to uh, refer to the literature on that. It would be what I would do. Sir? Yes. Right. Oh, um, you know, that's so kind of you. Thank you so much. That was actually a big part of why I wanted to be with the fish is that the Chilean sea bass is how the neighbor to the north, the Patagonian tooth fish, which has just been poached mercilessly uh, and very and militantly, uh, is marketed. And so the Mawsonii, the Dysosticus Mawsonii to the south, they're really brother-sister species, uh, is about the same in terms of it's a wonderful white meat, it's a precious, it's really fabulous eating. Um, and we did so because we collected the animals at times, and we could feed the whole station. I sent one of them to Vostok, which is another story. But uh, don't believe it. Don't go, don't go for that Chilean sea bass. That is not the sustainable fish for you to be investing in. Arthur de Vries, Dr. De Vries, Deep Vries, Deep Vries uh, out of Urbana-Champaign, a mentor to me, uh, is retired emeritus uh, at Urbana-Champaign. That was his home institute. And I was in touch with him recently, and they actually had a falling off period in population because of the fishing pressure. So there is a connection. And, and we had a record of... Uh, several thousand fish that had been captured, tagged, and released. So unless we were causing 100% mortality, which we weren't because we got recaptures for uh, that size of data set. So the fish really migrate. The fish have a really wide range or they're smart enough to never get caught the second time. So yeah, I would say... I, would, I know that uh, over on the Drake Passage side that, uh, well, the pirate fishery is, is really lucrative. Yeah, so that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Chilean sea bass is not actually uh, what it's meant to be. Thank you. Other thoughts? Other, David. You know, that's a really tough question. Uh, butyl acetate? There's an array of drilling fluids. What they do is they try and mimic the density of the ice and backfill the borehole. So the borehole is not left vacant or it'll close quite quickly. So it's left with drilling fluid in it. And when you do some of the history of the chemistry of these drilling fluids, you're like, wow. Like the butyl acetate, for example, Kathy's been exposed to that. That's a respiratory hazard. They had to more work in masks. Yeah. The, yes, it is. Yes. Well, you'd think it would equilibrate because it'll equi equilibrate quickly. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Sea salt. Oh, well, I think you should go soon. I think you should go soon because, you, you, I mean, they used to do, you know, ski to the North Pole. They're not doing that much anymore. Uh, believe it or not, like three weeks. Yeah, not as long as you might imagine. 
And they cross a very fairly narrow section of the ice sheet, though. Uh, they, it's a, getting off on the east side is the challenge. Yeah, a lot of people fly off of the east side because you can't get, uh, it's uh, too high of a risk getting through the glacial terrain over on that side. But they mostly start on the west because of the Kangalushwak Airport. It's because they can get there. So, you have. That's not as pleasant as when you get up and you go right to the kitchen tent, which is kind of, I'm sort of the helper guy. I'm the guy with the, the shovel and, and like the all around guy. So I do a lot of cooking and I do a lot of snow melting. And so what you have to do is make sure you're not doing carbon monoxide in the environment that you're heating, but you'll heat up your kitchen tent quite quickly and have a pretty pleasant indoor environment that'll be near uh, actually freezing, so, <laughs> so you want it to be below freezing, but you know, my personal best in terms of being outside, um, you know, is really quite cold, but working in minus 40 as long as you're active and well dressed and you're kind of limiting your appendage exposure, you can't do much without gloves. I blacked out once because I had like lost so much heat through my hands that I just was like going down and it was really weird, but it was like, 45 below, which is not that cold. The, the problem is that the colder temperatures, like at about 50 below, uh, that's when things start to break. That's when like all the electronics that you're kind of dealing with, the stuff you're babysitting while you're there uh, to maintain, uh, you, you touch it and it's like, oh, well, that's too bad, I, I broke that, I guess it was brittle. But at, at minus 40, it's, it's more manageable. <laughs> and, then, and then we don't go out if it's much colder than that. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> minus 75 is my personal best. Okay. But that's Fahrenheit. Well, we're warm-blooded animals and we just retain that heat. We just dress up really well and boy, you can't rest. You can't be exhausted. You're not allowed to be exhausted and say, boy, I'm done. I can't do anything. Because if you sit down uh, or if you do lose body heat, or if anything doesn't go well, like you drive off into a whiteout and then there you are, um, which I have done, you, uh, then you gotta kinda sit it out. You kinda gotta make sure that you maintain your body heat. So, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you, Bob.